Hello Church, this is Mario Bolivar, pastor of Eustos Presbyterian Church. Today, we're talking about Lent in our week two of our study. This study normally happens at 11 a.m., but as I was finishing the streaming, I realized that something was off and the whole lesson went without sound. And because I love this lesson so much and I think that you will benefit from it, I am willing to do the lesson all over again and knowing fully well that it's a great lesson and that you will benefit again from it. So we are on our week two of Lent and we are going to pay attention to our Lent study, The Way of Shalom. It's a study that you can download on our website or you can see day by day on our website or you can request a printed copy. They're already printed in the church office. However, let us pay attention to the days ahead of us. However, there is an introduction. The first thing that we have to consider is shalom means more than simply peace. Shalom is a compact word that can be used for many, many things. And last week, starting with uh, Lent, um, with Ash Wednesday, all the way to today, they want us to consider justice. Peace understands as justice. So as a matter of introduction, the lesson is asking us to consider, think about a time in your life when you were forgiven, but you didn't deserve it. In the same way, think about a time in your life when you ought to have forgiven someone and you didn't, or when you search for revenge or justice by your own hand. This is the consideration that the lesson is making us do. To consider justice as a conduct for peace. Now, obviously, we begin with Ash Wednesday as the first official day. General thoughts. Peace is truly more than the absence of war. However, includes that. We cannot think as Christians that peace is simply the absence of war, but we need to pray for the absence of war to be a reality. The absence of war doesn't mean 100% peace. However, it is part of it. We are to be faithfully praying and remember the place where the Prince of Peace, our Lord Jesus Christ, was born. Jerusalem has been for many, many years at the center of a conflict. We need to make sure that we pray for this holy place, which God designated for our Lord Jesus Christ to be born. Let us pray for peace, for the land where the Prince of Peace was born. This lesson from Ash Wednesday last week make us think about 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, that says, Finally, Brethren, farewell, mend your ways, heed my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. The encouragement is for us to live in peace, knowing that that will bring the God of love to be with us. What a wonderful lesson for us on this day. Then we continue on to Thursday. Thursday says that the art of greeting with peace and bring about peace can change the outcome of any situation. I don't have to tell you, but, but there are many stories where if we're able to bring peace in our mind, in our hearts, and in our attitude, we can dismantle a situation that was about to explode. We have to consider how significant those changes can be for us, for our families, for our friends, for the strangers that we encounter every day. Can you change your word hello for something with more meaningful, more for, for with 
something with more meaning. Peace of God. Whether they say peace of God be with you also, can we consider how we're greeting one another and how we are bringing peace with us into every situation, to the store, to the market, to the stranger where we're gonna about to pay the bill. Usually, if we bring peace, peace will come with us. Matthew 5 verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The main idea of this lesson that was supposed to be happening on Thursday last week is for us to be peacemakers, for us to bring the transformation of the world by bringing offerings of peace that we ought to begin with our greeting. This lesson is making us think about the conflict between Israel and Palestine and how even in the midst of their all, they are still able to greet each other with peace. Why? Because an offering of peace can change an outcome. And I know there are still difficult times in uh, Israel and Palestine and that I don't know the whole thing. And I'm still in the learning process. If anything, this week has been a time of reckoning for how little do I know about the rest of the world. Then on Friday, February 19, we were to consider a lesson on how we can bring peace, justice, when we keep broken promises, when we make amends from broken promises. It makes us think about how justice and peace go hand in hand and how we are to be able to help one another. God calls us to work for the well-being of everyone, not only of Christians, but of everyone in the world. We can begin the journey to peace in the world by repairing broken promises, not only from us, but from our neighbors, from our ancestors, from our government. I mean, this concept, this study, this lesson made me start searching the history of how our government has broken so many promises. And from those broken promises, a lot of other conflicts has come about. As an American now, as a nationalized citizen of the United States, I know that I wasn't part of this country when they did those things. However, I know that I need to be part of the reparations that needs to happen. Why? Because that brings the glory to God. Today, I want you to consider how, yes, you were not at fault for the things that happened in the past, but you need to recognize that you are benefited from it and that we are in charge of making reparations. John 14, verse 27 from the Revised Standard Version makes us think about this. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. We have to be able to consider moving forward with the hope that we can be the part of the change. We can bring peace by keeping the promises that other people before us broke. We can change the world by, fulfill us, by fulfilling the injustices and taking care of them from our ancestors, even if you just arrived to this country. This, uh, this is making us think about uh, peace for immigrants, the idea is not to consider the humanitarian and national security border crisis with the lens of political views or the safety of our country. But we have to remember as citizens of the kingdom of God, as believers in Christ, that we need to admit the basic instinct of migration seeking better fortune, more stability. Sure. There's a lot of criminals arriving in these batches of people who are arriving. 
However, there is also good people seeking a better future. There is legal and illegal. Yes, immigration exists in all types, shapes, and forms. However, today the lesson is considering for us to think about the basic need to migrate seeking a better future. That's a human condition. That's an animal condition that we have to be able to accept and improve. If we don't like how immigration is happening, look, there is a way that you cannot stop it. So there is, there is needs to be a conclusive and better way to do immigration. I can tell you it is far too difficult. You cannot stop it. So you might as well just jump and make recommendations of how is it that needs to be done. But we have to consider that it, you cannot stop it because it's a basic human condition. Immigration is a basic human condition. We are in grave. Animals are in grave. We move from state to state seeking better life conditions. Why would you think that we can stop it from other countries? We can't. However, we need to learn to adapt and make recommendations. Why? Because it's a basic human condition. We cannot stop it, but we can help manage it. Proverbs 12, 20 makes us think about this. It says, the seed is in the heart of those who devise evil. Yes, there is people moving from place to place to do evil, but there's also people who have goodness in their hearts, who wants to build a better future for them and their families. For them and because of them, we need to have a comprehensive immigration policy. We have to plan good because we have joy in our hearts. Now, Sunday, February 21st, we are to consider peace for Nigeria. In this moment, the lesson is making us think about the larger spectrum of reality in our world. It is not that we only need to be considered about our own peace or the peace of my immediate neighbor or the peace of my country, but that realization is that if you don't have peace, someone else around the country is going to be affected by it. In the same way, if someone around the world is being affected by violence or the lack of peace, we will not have peace either. The general thoughts for Sunday, February 21st was, how much do you really know about what's happening in Nigeria? We don't. That's not something that is easy to find unless you're looking for it. If there is anything that this book of the way of Shalom is encouraging us is to broad our view of the world and how we are able to participate. We need to be striving for establishment of relationships, of just relationships. We need to acknowledge that violence will never bring about peace. Peace is not something that you can force. You can only bring peace if you enter in a situation with peace. However, violence can stop violence, but it creates more violence. Violence will never ever bring peace. Peace only comes from God, from the believing of the justice of relationships, of the well-being of others. We have to consider the knowledge. How little do we know about the rest of the world? We need, as Americans, we need to recognize that unless peace is experienced by everyone, we will never know real peace. And even when everyone is at peace, it's just part of it because real peace comes from God, God alone. This is one significant aspect of this lesson. We need to consider that peace, peace that is not from everyone, or for everyone, is a piece that we will not know. It makes us think about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For he is our peace. Jesus, God, 
in his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. There is a hostility between you and me that can only be healed by the love and the power of Jesus. What an important lesson for us to consider on that day. Uh, on Monday, February 22nd, they were, the lesson is making us think about indigenous people. We have to consider the wrong, the evil that our government did long, long time ago against our indigenous people. I can say that I didn't know much about it, but on that day, Monday last of this week, I started reading more about how unfair and evil our government was against the indigenous people. How treacherous we were. Again, as an American, now I have to admit that while I am not at fault for those things, I am responsible for making reparations, for making the change. General thoughts. Perfect peace only comes from God. It is bestowed when we trust God's love and mercy. However, we can participate in the work of peace from our very own corner. While we cannot change whatever happened to the indigenous people in America long, long, long time ago, we can begin making reparations. And yes, it is not our fault. But it's our responsibility to make amends. Why? Because we know Christ right now. It's like this. Are we guilty of Romans killing Jesus? No, not necessarily. However, we still are guilty. We are found guilty because of our sinful nature. That idea plays out throughout our history. People before us have done awful things. And we continue to do awful things. But we need to start making reparations for the things that our ancestors did and the things that we continue to do. God's call is that we acknowledge. We have to confess the sins of our doing and the sins of others. We have to admit that many times we have gone wrong and we have been charged to make it right today. We might not be guilty, but there is an idea. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. Which one are you? Pay attention to Isaiah 26, verse 3. Those of steadfast mind you keep in peace. In peace because they trust in you. The prophet Isaiah was part of the solution. And he's inviting us to be also part of that solution. Then on Tuesday, February 23rd, the lesson, our study guide, which you can find online um, in our website, is asking us to consider the conflict in Korea. I must once again admit that I was pretty not knowledgeable of the conflict. I didn't know that America had such a role and that Russia had such a role in the divisiveness within Korea. I didn't know that. I, in, in Colombia, when growing up, we, didn't, we were not part of that history, so that history was not taught to us. But on that day, as I'm reading this, this study, which is a great thing for, for us, I was like, wow, what a role did we play? And we're still playing today. How much do you know about the conflict in Korea? Perhaps you know a lot, but does your neighbor know a lot? And is it your job to teach and share with others what you know? Yes. Sometimes doing the right thing isn't enough. There's a high price to pay when we think we consider that we can force peace on others. It never works like that. However, the gospel gives us peace, gives us encouragement when it says in Philippians 4, 
chapter 6 and 7. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We need to be able to believe that we can be agents of change, not because of our own strength or power, but because God resides in us. In the same way, the next day, Wednesday, well, don't, don't pay attention to that spelling on Wednesday. But anyway, uh, it says, peace for the Congo. Once again, little do I know about the conflict of the Congo. Do you know much about the conflict that is happening over there? Have you considered how difficult it is to exist in a time such as this, full of a pandemic? with thousands of millions of people dying each day, and yet there is a conflict of violence? I mean, if it's very difficult to continue existing in the midst of a pandemic, can you imagine adding a conflict in the way that the, Con the Congo is experiencing? We are reminded again that we are supposed to be praying for the things that we find out. How much do we know about the conflict of El Congo? Doing the right thing isn't enough. Sometimes we need to do more than the right thing. We need to have faith in the one that goes before us. Pay attention to Psalm 85. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The real peace that God is offering doesn't come from the absence of war. It's included, but it doesn't come from the absence of war. We have to do more all the time. Doing the right thing isn't enough. Sometimes we have to take a step back and look how far we have gone and how much more we have to go. Lisa, who was doing a study with us earlier today, shared a wonderful story. She read in a devotional that a girl one time was trying to climb. And as she was climbing, she found out that she couldn't go higher because she didn't know how. So what she did was that she stepped back and she was able to look up and to say, oh, there is a new way forward. So she climbed again and continued to proceed past where she was stuck before. However, next to her, there was another child. A child who wanted just to try his best to always climb and climb and climb. And this child didn't want to take a step back. Didn't want to see the bigger picture. He was just spending more energy and energy trying to climb. And he couldn't. He was stuck. How many of us are like the child who takes a step back and looks at the bigger picture? How many of us are like that child who simply thinks that by energy, you can do it all? We have our limits. That's what Lent is about. And for us to recognize that it is through God that we can truly find peace. Today, we are to consider this question. How can we pray for people, situations, and places that we do not know? Korea, El Congo, Israel. I've never been to those places. I don't know what they look like. Maybe in pictures, but that's it. How can I pray for things and people that I don't know? Great! That's a great question. And why the Apostle Paul address the question to Colossians, to the church in Colossians. The Apostle Paul didn't know the church there. In fact, the Apostle Paul was in jail in Rome and took the time to write to them to say, you're not alone. You're not supposed to be alone. Look, here I am praying for you. I don't know you. You don't know me, but we have the same spirit. Can we pray for people who we don't know about situations that doesn't affect us, apparently? Yes, and we must 
that is what this lesson is trying to teach us. We are supposed to be paying attention to the trouble besides our own. We have to be considering the suffering of the people around the world. We're supposed to be considering the suffering of the people who are not Christians, who are yet to believe. We need to convince them of the presence of God because of the love that we show, not because of the message that we preach. We are supposed to be praying for others. We are supposed to be moving forward on behalf of others. Colossians 3 verse 15 says, And let peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let us pray for the things that we are yet to know. Let us pray for the people that we are yet to meet. Let us pray for the countries where we have never set foot on. However, let us pray with the same spirit and be thankful that we have the opportunity to bring about change. Not that we're going to force it. Not that we have the solution. But that is our spirit that can send things forward. Today, our lesson for Lent ends in this prayer. God of peace, continue to bless us with the knowledge that no matter how wide the divisions, we can live together in peace. The divisions of the world are not our inheritance, for we are heirs of unity as children of God. In Christ we pray. Amen. Church, I hope that you are taking the time to do the daily readings and do the extra work of finding things or finding where things are located. Uh, the information that is being provided is actual and factual. Take a time to dwell in the study. You can download this on our website. You can see it day by day or download the whole 30-some copies of the study. Remember that we are gathering every Thursday at 11 a.m. to do a conversation. Obviously, today I'm doing it like this because we did it at 11 and the video was out there. However, there was an issue with the sound and we recorded the whole thing without sound. So I am taking the time, the effort to do this. Why? Because it's necessary. And because I believe that God would use this to continue planting seeds of peace in our hearts for the benefit of the world. Church, that is all for today. Until I see you next time, be blessed.